All right, good morning, brothers and sisters. And today, we're actually going to be taking a break on our series on the book of Proverbs. If you've been with us for the past few months, from the beginning of the year, we've been studying the book of Proverbs, and we're about halfway through the section that we're planning to preach on. So it's a good moment to pause right now, so that we can get into a short three-part doctrinal topical series on the subject of kingdom. Now, why are we doing that all of a sudden? Well, because, as all of us here, I'm sure, are aware, this year is election year for both us Indonesians and our American friends, and maybe other countries too that I'm not aware of. But the powers that be have decided that this year it might be fruitful for us to give some perspective about this issue, because this time around there seems to be a greater difference of opinion amongst Christians than at least the ones that I can remember, and a greater degree of anxiety as to the results, depending on you know, your political sensibilities. At least that's what the CCC, NBA Fantasy, WhatsApp group chat tells me, okay? So while I know that religion and politics are two of the most sensitive subjects that we can discuss, and we are all aware that mixing politics and religion can be a very dangerous thing, so I'm really trying to tread lightly here. It cannot be avoided that the Bible really gives us some perspective on this. Because God's people have indeed been dealing with political instability for the vast majority of their existence. And today, we'll be studying one of the clearest texts where this really comes into view, where Israel themselves kind of had their own elections, right? It's the backstory of Israel's monarchy from 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel is about to preach on Samuel, right? So let's read it, 1 Samuel chapter 8. When Samuel became an old, he made his sons uh, judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiyah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be the perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants. And he will take your male and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Okay? So, friends, what we have just read is, was the advent of the most 
significant political transition in Israel's history. And in our own season of political changes, this text gives us actually a few principles that might be helpful for us as we seek to navigate in this season in an active and engaged way. A way for us to actually care and participate in these political processes while being able to at least fend off the restlessness and panic that we might have to deal with when the political climate looks gloomy from where we stand. And I propose that our text brings into view three principles that we can meditate on so that we can keep calm and carry on in whatever state the leadership of our country is at any given point in time, okay? So our three points that we need to keep in mind, point one, the kind of kings we think we want, two, the kind of kings we always seem to get, and three, the only king we really need, the kind of kings we think we want, the kind of kings we always get, and the only king we need. Let's get into it. Point one, the kind of kings we think we want. So let me start off with a bit of context that I think is necessary to, uh, for us to fully appreciate what's going on here. We are now at the point of Israel's history when there was no king over Israel. The nation of Israel came to settle in the land of Canaan about 300 years ago at this point, but they've never been unified really under one government. They shared the same heritage, culture, religion, and customs, so there's definitely unity and solidarity among them. But at this point of the story, they operated more like a federation of mostly independent tribes. And the highest authority in Israel was this office called judge, right? Uh, and this was who Samuel was. However, unlike kings, judges were not heads of states that lived in palaces or collected taxes and so on. Back then, judges were these tribal leaders who were called by God and would be usually given some sort of battle prowess or military acumen that allowed them to lead God's people into victory in the battles that they were fighting against the surrounding nation, right? And so if you want to know more about this, this history is actually super interesting and uh, you can check out the book of Judges to know more. But the crucial detail that I want to highlight is that Judges was never supposed to be elected or gained by inheritance. Judges were always supposed to be appointed especially by God himself. So what Samuel did there in verse 1 to 3 that caused uh, Israel uh, to request for a king actually broke the SOP, right? He was out of line. Though as far as we know, Samuel had been a righteous judge who feared the Lord, his sons certainly were not, and Samuel never had the authority to commit nepotism and put them in these positions of power that they had no business being in and that they ultimately abused for their own gain. And ultimately, any parallels to what's been going on is completely coincidental. I'm not making any political statement right now. Right? And furthermore, this was a time where there was actually an urgent need in Israel for strong and decisive leadership. They were in the middle of a war that they were actually losing. And the chapters before what we were reading, it's all about how they got trashed by the Philistines and ended up losing the Ark of the Covenant. So the, the situation was urgent. And what I'm trying to bring out here by explaining all this is that Israel's anxiety was 100% understandable and warranted. There was nothing wrong with their desire to have a leader who had both integrity and the competence to ensure national security. In fact, God in the future got very angry when Israel tolerated corrupt leaders and were, looking, uh, were not looking to God to give them leadership. So it's a good and even righteous thing for them to be concerned about the current ineffective and corrupt 
system of government. In addition to that, in fact, the fact that they asked for a king itself is not the problem. They actually had, for example, in Deuteronomy, laws about having kings. And even back in Genesis, God revealed to Jacob that there will be kings amongst his descendants. So at the very least, God foresaw that Israel was going to have kings, and he didn't ban the idea altogether. So the desire is good, and the proposed solution isn't necessarily long. What's the problem, right? Why did Samuel and God seem livid at the request that Israel had in verse 6 for a king? And I think our text specifies quite clearly. It's the kind of king that Israel wanted. Instead of a king that was supposed to lead them to be faithful to the Lord, Israel asked for a king like the other nations. Because actually, God had already been quite specific to them about what kind of king should be ruling Israel. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 and following, if you're interested in looking it up. And basically there, it's describing Israel's king as a a spiritual leader as opposed to be a military general, who was supposed to be a student of Scripture and even hand-wrote his own copy of the Torah. That's actually one of the qualifications. Because the true leader of God's people is not meant to lead according to his own wisdom and power, but always in accordance to God's guidance. And the Israelites didn't seem interested in this. They saw other nations had powerful, mighty kings who won battles for them, and they were like, could you use one of those? And so they used their criteria for a king instead of the one that God gave them. And interestingly, in the eyes of the Lord, this desire for a king is not a simple exploration of alternative solutions to their problems. But God saw it as a symptom of this festering disease that Israel has had for generations. And it's clear there in verse 8 what this is. It's the problem of idolatry. According to all the deeds that they have done, verse 8 says, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt and even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. It's idolatry. And we talk about this a lot in CCC, right? How in the Bible, idolatry isn't limited to like changing your religion or simply worshiping some other God in addition to our God or uh, replacing other God, our God. But the heart of the act of idolatry is actually a misplacement of trust and love. Making something that is not God as our ultimate joy, our ultimate hope, our ultimate source of significance, security, and value. So when Israel requested for a king to God, it's just another relapse of their idolatrous mistrust that they've been showing. How generation after generation, even though God had consistently proven himself to be faithful and always delivered them from the enemies that threatened them, even though God had always been patient and willing to forgive their rebellion, even then, still, Israel wanted God to give them someone else instead of just trusting him for their hope and security. No no wonder here, right, that God was frustrated Now, how does this story help us think about the political transitions that we might be going through this year? Well, perhaps the first thing that must be said is that your political activism, passion for justice and participation in making our country a better place is not at all discouraged. It's actually wonderful if you're not numb to the brokenness around us and are hoping for changes that'll improve what is wrong, right? All that is commendable. However, this text, I think, does encourage us to be careful to not fall into idolatrous mistrust of our leaders or our political systems. By being vigilant and making sure that our trust in God 
is what guides our thoughts and actions in response to this. Right, so let me give you some examples to clarify what I mean. Right? Let's say the result of this particular election has not gone in the way that you hope for. Is our immediate thought, our country is doomed, we're all done for? Is our immediate plan of action leaving the country or planning an exit strategy? Are our immediate feelings fear and anxiety? Or do we trust the Lord enough to say that this is the leader that God has appointed and he is not perfect? But at the same time, we can be like Jesus who said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, meaning that Jesus was committed to continue to perform his civic duties even in the context of a much more oppressive Roman Empire. And can we process our fears and anxieties about the leaders that we have in a way that in the end we end up with, above all, greater reliance on the Lord? And likewise, of course, if we did pick the winning candidate, are we pridefully gloating about it and treating those who disagree with us as inferior or somehow the problem hindering this country. You see, the point I'm trying to make is that our feelings and our reactions to what's going on reveal much about what's going on in our hearts. Okay? Like, what is it that we really care about and who or what that can be an idol to us? Because when our idols are fed, we become prideful. And when our idols are challenged or are proving to be ineffective, we become fearful and anxious. And that applies in the context of this election, and I suppose in many other areas in our lives when we've made, created things, idols for us. So it wouldn't hurt for us to notice what's going on in our hearts. Because friends, the scary thing about how God works is that, that, even, that, that when we insist in feeding our idols and putting our hopes in them, God will not tyrannically force us to follow Him. Rather, in verse 9 and later again in verse 22, we see that although God will certainly warn us about the consequences of our choices, ultimately, He will respect them and he will hand us over to the consequences of our foolish choices. And this is point two, the kind of kings we always seem to get. It's interesting, isn't it, how God's MO has never been to impose his will upon us. But actually, God kind of plays along with our foolishness and allows us to learn from our consequences and mistakes. You see, you can notice that God tells Samuel twice to give them what they asked for. Okay, now, okay, don't freak out, young reformer and restless, right? I'm not an open theist. I don't think that God is at the mercy of human will, right? He is still sovereign. He is still the first cause of all things and in control of everything. But it cannot be avoided that the scriptures do give us a picture of a God who teaches us by patiently and resiliently bearing with us as we make our mistakes. And this is exactly what God had done for Israel. Let's for, uh, fast forward a bit to chapter 9 and following, right? As the Bible tells us the story of Saul, the king that God, uh, that God ultimately appointed for Israel. It's interesting that although God was the one who singled out Saul to be king, the language used to describe what happened mostly says that Saul is the king that Israel chose. It's almost God knew what kind of king the Israels had in mind and presented to them what would appear to be the ideal candidate. And he chose a man who was described as good looking, right? Like a head taller than most people and having servants, so wealthy, tall, rich, and handsome. The perfect man, right? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, at first at least, everything seemed to work out all right. 
Right? The Israelites were stoked when Saul was elected. They shouted, long live the king. And Saul even managed to win some battles early on. It looked promising. But as the story of Saul progresses, and we see him go through hardship and put to the test in moments of decision, we continue to see him failing repeatedly to obey. And showing his true colors and the story of 1 Samuel is a story of how he, Saul continued to descend into this insecure and anxious wreck who ended up messing everything up. And the point the author is unmistakably trying to make in this book is that what looks good and what sounds appealing and our limited human perspective might not actually be the right thing. And Saul's story is essentially a case study about how our human idols will consistently fail to deliver. So be careful what you ask for. God might just give it to you. And so what might our idols do to us? Okay, so let's come back to the text and look at again, verse 10 to 18. In between texts where God tells Samuel to give the people what they want, we see God clearly outlining for them the consequences of their choices. They ask for a king like the nations, and God explains plainly to them what sort of things do the king of other nations do to their people. And the text tells us that these kings are going to take our sons and daughters and make it work for him to fight for his army, to work in his industries, to grow his economy. He's also going to raise taxes by taking your grain, taking your flocks, and the rest and the best of your servants. They're going uh, to be about taking, right? Check out how many times the word take there is repeated in the narrative. And eventually, we're going to be his slaves or servants made to serve his purposes instead of being loved and protected by our leader, right? And this is interesting that it's specifically written that they're going to take a tenth of our grain and our flock, which is actually less what our government currently takes from us, right? But would any of you venture to guess to whom it was commanded Israel gave a tenth of their production to? And who it is that Israel is opposed to exclusively and ultimately be servants of? It's the Lord alone, isn't it? So I think the point of the story that it's trying to communicate is really clear. That the idols that we picked for ourselves, though they can flatter, it's only able to deceive. And they're going to look and sound like they're going to give, 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 but in the end, given enough time and power, they're going to take, take, take. Because by nature, our idols will try to usurp God in our lives. They're always going to try to take over and leave us oppressed, dependent, and disappointed. Have you guys ever experienced this with your own idols? Whereby you have pursued something, some relationship, some job, some lifestyle, putting your hopes on it and making sacrifices for it, but in the end, still finding yourself lacking the security and fulfillment you were seeking. In the end, still feeling like we put in more than we, what we actually got out of it. And I wouldn't be surprised if we all have to some extent. Our hearts are factories of idols. And so we wouldn't be surprised, and we shouldn't be surprised, if any human leader that we choose will ultimately disappoint us if we make an idol of him or her. Now, I think this perspective then allows us to do a couple of things, particularly in our own modern context with respect to how we respond to political transitions. On the one hand, it allows us to actually participate in the political process conscientiously, right? 
It's crazy to think that actually it's only been around 25 years that we Indonesians even had a choice about who our head of state is going to be. Before that, we just basically had to accept whoever it is that happens to be in power. So by all means, right, let us exercise this privilege. Let us hold our government accountable and desire that they do their job with integrity and excellence. More than ever, we have the power to resist the government's attempt to take, take, take from their own people and to advantage those who are in power. But on the other hand, we can also be sober-minded about our leaders. That no matter what they have accomplished, no matter their popularity and performance, we know that at the end of the day, no matter how great they are, this person is nothing more than a human. Corruptible and susceptible to sin, still capable of failing and turning out worse than what we hope for, just like you and I are. So at the end of the day, at best, if our leaders are really great, they can give us some hope for optimism, but never grounds for ultimate hope. Because it's always been the case that God alone is worthy to sit on the throne. He alone possesses the wisdom and power to create lasting peace for his people. And the good news that the Bible is trying to tell us is that the true king of the universe is committed to doing this no matter what we choose, which is point three, the only king we really need. So perhaps most of you know how this uh, story of Saul ends. Saul, the king that Israel chose, miserably failed, and God didn't just hand them over to uh, destruction, Israel, I mean, and says, I told you so. But because God has already committed himself to his people, he was faithful to raising up another king for his people by choosing David, a man after God's own heart, though his outward appearance was nowhere near as impressive as Saul. And as you might be familiar, David did a lot better than Saul as king. David feared the Lord, and in turn, the Lord empowered him to do cool things like kill a giant and comprehensively defeat his enemies and secure the promised land for Israel. But even David, as God-fearing as he was, even he failed and gave, up to the, gave in to the corruption of sin and committed some unspeakably evil act. And then because of that, David's house also was dysfunctional and divided. His own son ended up trying to assassinate him. And at the end of his life, if we see the end of 2 Samuel, David was a man who was haunted by many sorrows as well after leaving a trail of dead bodies in his wake. But that part of David's life didn't make it in the Jesus Storybook Bible, right? And after that, after David, it was pretty much downhill for the monarchy of Israel. Every king who sat on their throne that was established through Israel's idolatrous mistrust proved to be evil and unworthy at some point. And Israel herself was led astray by their leaders, ending up with foreign occupiers destroying their cities, occupying their land, and their people exiled in a foreign land under a godless and oppressive governments who marginalized them and truly made them into slaves. So the hope, friends, that resonates throughout the Old Testament, the promise that God gave to his people is that they will not be in the tyranny, under the tyranny of evil men forever. That one day, God will send a king from a descendant of David, the true and better David, a king whose delight is in the fear of the Lord, who does not judge according to his own wisdom and power, but according to the righteousness of God. And he shall win the war, 
not by striking his enemies down with weapons, but with the word of his mouth. And with his lips, he will end wickedness and sin in the world and reclaim his world, comfort his people, and establish peace in it forever. That's how Isaiah 11 describes his coming king. However, we also learn that this king who will be sent is not a king that his people will choose. This king, unlike Saul, had no beauty of appearance to speak of. And in fact, nobody believes in the news that he's bringing. And instead of being accepted, he will actually be rejected by his people, even struck down and killed by his own people. The king that God sends is the man of sorrows, like we have sung, who did not take the riches of his people for himself, but gave all of himself, even his own life, he gave up his glory for the iniquities and transgressions of his people, so that we can have peace, so that we can be truly safe from the sin that ultimately threatens us. And I hope we all catch right now that Jesus is this king. He is the king that nobody saw coming. The king who came in humility, whose power was in his weakness, whose exaltation came in his most humiliating moment, who subverted every expectation to show us that in God's kingdom, things are done a different way. How in God's kingdom, we don't need to kill each other. We don't need to lie and steal because in his kingdom, his own personal life and love will sustain us forever. And his, in his kingdom, justice will always be upheld and everybody will be taken care of. And friends, because Jesus was raised from the grave after dying for our sins, this confirms that he is right now the king who reigns. So any human authority that happens to exist right now, they're under him and his authority. And even the longest reigning leaders are ultimately but a blip in God's eternal kingdom. So friends, if we are following him, we have every reason to hope that though the political circumstances might temporarily make some of our lives a bit complicated, we know how the story ends. That the kingdom of the earth shall be the kingdom of Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And those of us who believe are right now already citizens of this heavenly kingdom. So if this is really true, God is really the king right now. How would this change your life? Now we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means for us to live in this upside down kingdom next week. But with regards to the occasion of our series, let me give you my take on the implications, right? Because for me at least, it makes the result of any election that we're ever going to have more like mirrors of who we are instead of maps of the future. Telling us more about how divided we are and what the idols of our culture prove themselves to be instead of what the future of our nation could possibly be. Remember, God gives us over to our idols. But we Christians can take courage because although nobody knows what the future holds, we know the one who holds the future. And if our ultimate trust is in him, we can advocate and participate in bringing peace and prosperity, shalom to our land, not from a place of anxiety and fear, but from a position of security and ultimate hope. Doesn't that sound like a better place to be in relation to these circumstances that we're in. Glad of that? Let's pray. 
Blessed are you, Lord, King of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, we know every, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you are sovereign absolutely over all things. No, the mouth of the kings cannot speak unless you open them, and not even a hair on our head can fall unless you have allowed it to be. But Father, we confess that our hearts are restless, that our hearts are fixated on the kings that are before us instead of the king that is reigning right now in heaven. Lord, give us eyes to see by your Holy Spirit, your heavenly and eternal rule, and let us have peace because we are able to rest in your kingdom, in your reign over us. Reveal to us, Lord, the times in which we have trusted not only in our worldly leaders, but in any idols that we think can give us hope and a future. And let us hold on to the eternal future that is secured by your Son for us and that you have offered for us freely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.